It is Monday, so that means we are joined in the studio by Dr. David Kwok, clinical instructor specializing in family medicine at s u n c h e o n y a n g University Hospital. Good morning, Dr. Kwok. Good morning again. As always, you are here every Monday to answer our burning questions <laughs> um, and also... Get a little depth into sort of the issues that have been raised over the coronavirus in the past week. And uh, it seems we are bombarded with news stories all the time. Some a little preposterous. Um, We'll be getting to that later on. But Mm -hmm. um, why don't we start off um, with the sort of the most alarming trend right now. We are seeing a spike in the number of cases, especially here in the Seoul metropolitan area, more than 50 for the past two days. And then the percentage of untraceable cases has now neared 90%. Mm -hmm. So we are surpassing the standards that the government had set out initially when we switched over to this everyday life quarantine. Um, Can you explain again once the significance of these numbers? I don't imagine they were set arbitrarily. So why are these new numbers such grave concern for us? Right. So let's uh, talk about the Mm -hmm. untraceable cases first. Okay. Um, It's the most important uh, composition of the numbers currently because... Uh, we are not able to find out where the infection came from Mm -hmm. uh, for the untraceable uh, cases. It usually means that there would be uh, at least 10-folds to 30-folds of numbers of people behind one case of untraceable case. 10 to 20-fold, because we know that the R-naught number for confirmed cases or the traceable supposedly is like nearly two now, right? Right. We're nearly two, but untraceable is 10 to 20-fold? That's that's, that's a rough guess, (gasps) uh, Mm -hmm. but it still is, I I, I would say it's legitimate number to uh, lay out Mm -hmm. because uh, because we don't know where it actually came from. Uh, We have to imagine there would be a vast, uh, great number of people possibly asymptomatic right. uh, that caused this one person to come up with either a symptom or some sort of uh, speculation for the mm-hmm. infection that that person has finally come out of it. Also, what's also uh, very important is that uh, for the untraceable uh, cases, we are seeing a repetitive cases coming out of certain geographical areas. True. Uh, t- uh, two or three more uh, mm-hmm. or more of the um, areas that are within Seoul or also in the vicinity of Seoul area uh, are showing more and more numbers coming mm-hmm. out of that specific area. So we need to pay a, a very um, focus mm-hmm. uh, uh, um, eye mm-hmm. <laughs> on these areas to find out how... Uh, quickly it might be spreading in the area Mm -hmm. and who uh, among which population it might be spreading Mm -hmm. through. So that's one big uh, major factor that we have to focus currently. Also the number uh, um, having uh, the Ministry of Health and um, I forgot the name. Welfare. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Having uh, having said um, that that, uh, the number 50 is the the, uh, pivoting point Mm -hmm. uh, where they might uh, consider jumping back back up Uh to the the, uh, social distancing measure. Uh, It's because... Within, if we keep uh, the number of increase within the number of 50, it might be manageable. For the medical system, exactly. the healthcare system. We might have the buffer to contain all the newly coming up people um, 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 within the facilities mm-hmm. that we already have. But if it ex- starts to exceed that number, we might be out of the, um, the methods and, and, and the right. means. Obviously, it took us a while to go back to this like everyday life quarantine. It's not even mm. quite not life as normal, right. but it took us a while to get there. Right. So understandably, government and of course, even company, everyone would be reluctant to return to the stricter sort of social distancing measures exactly. that we saw, even though, of course, we never had the really strict lockdown that we saw in other places. Exactly. In your opinion, do you think the two weeks buffer, yeah. the sort of time frame that they said now, if we have two weeks of continued numbers like this, then mm. we'll go back. back. Do you think that's an adequate measure? Um, just for the cases that are coming up currently, I, I, I'm just hoping that it could be uh, um, elongated a little bit. Uh, because Elongated as mean, in what? Meaning more, greater, than two, greater than two weeks. Okay. Um, because uh, when I see the patients that are being admitted to my personally, uh, my, uh, our hospital, mm-hmm. um, compared to the ones that were admitted before, they are seemingly staying longer. Mm. And they're also coming up with larger numbers in the load of detection. 
version of uh-huh. the virus. They're not um, so s- more symptomatic than mm-hmm. uh, the people before, but they're actually, number-wise, they're just showing up more numbers, staying longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that being said, I, um, I think we have to... Maybe think about even having them, well, uh, judging or or calculating at least three to four weeks of, um, um, what do you call it, incubation period or or, or, or seemingly uh, keeping keen eyes on on, on these Uh people because they seem to be coming up with much larger numbers. On a related note, if we have those continued numbers and you're seeing the longer stay in the hospitals Mm -hmm. and also the greater load, and, you know, we know that by now about one in three may be asymptomatic, isn't it actually maybe better for them to be just self-isolating at home unless they develop very strong sort of and serious symptoms and reduce the load on on the medical um, front lines and the hospitals? Think of it on the long term because... Right. That's actually... a very uh, good idea, Mm -hmm. number one. But uh, at this point, just at this point, I still believe that our medical system can manage this. Handle it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it, it'll be better to isolate them in, within a facility that we can ha- keep our eyes on them mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to ha- having them stay at their own house, not knowing whether they might actually leave the house or not. True. So I think at this point, it'll mm-hmm. be safer to, uh, for us to keep them inside the facilities. All right. Let's hope that we can keep those numbers down then. So Let's turn to our second topic, which is, of course, masks. They hadn't been in the news for a while, but right. they are definitely in the news. news once again. Let's start with um, some advice given by the WHO, somewhat belatedly, I think, for Mm -hmm. um, us who have been, of course, living with masks on for the past couple of months. They actually now change their sort of official advice. And they're saying that, yes, masks should be worn where the virus is widespread and uh, you cannot maintain that physical distancing. And then they also issued some guidance on the composition of these sort of non-medical grade fabric masks for the public. Um, Um, saying that they should consist of at least three layers of different materials. Um, We don't have to go into the details of that. Mm -hmm. Um, We've got lots of masks going out right now. Mm -hmm. Um, But as for those people who may be interested, it is quite interesting that um, there should be a water absorbent material in the middle. middle. That should be like maybe a cotton. Um, There should also be an outer layer, which is water resistant, such as polyester as well. Right. In your professional opinion, does that make sense? And are this, is this kind of like the basic structure of masks that we see already out there? You're actually right on point. Okay. Um, it, is, it, is, uh, it does make sense because the masks uh, that were designed, well, not designed, but, but put out by the WHO, it is to have people who cannot either afford masks mm-hmm. currently. So we're not talking about really Korea here. Okay. We're talking about worldwide. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, possibly in India, possibly in other countries. When they have to make their property. own masks? Exactly. I see. That they have to come up with some sort of alternative method to mm-hmm. uh, make something that are very uh, close to the medical grade um, masks. Okay. Uh, of course, they would not be as par mm-hmm. with the medical grade masks, but it, it's, it's a very sec- second to top, top mm-hmm. uh, uh, alternative to the, to the medical grade masks. It could ones. also be uh, I guess, useful for, because we're seeing a lot of different masks come out, um, like fashion masks. These design companies are now coming up with their own sort of versions. They may be very nice to look at and Mm -hmm. may set you apart, but they Mm -hmm. still should follow these, I guess, basic guidelines. Yes, because as we mentioned in in the layers of the mask, uh, a part of it has to block out the droplets from coming in and Uh also going out. Mm -hmm. Uh, But also a part of it has to absorb water droplets and fluid liquids so that it'll... uh, um, It won't. It won't be able to um, excrete out excrete, of it. Right. Exactly. Because so, it has to protect from inbound and outbound. Exactly. So we have to think about the purpose of the uh, right. masks that that they are. Well, the Korean government has now um, sort of given its green light to um, these anti-droplet masks, and we saw a mad rush for them um, starting last week. And I understand from 9 a.m. they've also started the second batch. Yes. Still a mad rush. Um, Mm -hmm. Only, what, um, less than a million going out. So um, thankfully for those who are interested, from the 20th, you can now get them at um, these sort of large supermarts. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it'll be easier. Um, Lay out the difference between these... anti-droplet fancy KFAD mask and the regular sort of surgical masks or dental masks that many of us have already been um, using. Yeah. So this KFAD mask is is also another alternative method to uh, coming up uh, up with something 
that is close to a uh, medical grade mask. Mm-hmm. Medical grade mask, as we already know, are in the grades of KF80 or KF94, meaning they block out a very minuscule um, um, particle mm-hmm. sizes. Right. Uh, KF80 is not quite as uh, screening uh, uh, per se, mm-hmm. but it all, it, it'll definitely let us block Uh, mm-hmm. the droplets that are uh, being transmitted um, in, uh, between people. The amount that they do block, they're similar to um, surgical masks or dental masks, right? Like it might be AD? slightly less. Oh, uh, really? I would say okay. that uh, from, uh, from a report, I saw that it was close to KF70. Okay. To, in between mm-hmm. KF70 and KF80. Yeah, KF I think 80. there was a range between 55 and 80 or so. Right. So quite similar to the dental masks that a lot of us are already exactly. using. Exactly. And it'll, it is also very much lighter. Mm-hmm. So it'll be much easier to wear them, especially in hot weather like mm-hmm. these where we're having now. I understand that they kind of came up with this because they're much more breathable. And then also dental masks were in short supply as well. But if you've got both, if you have dental masks, will there be a huge difference whether you use that or these AD masks? Um, To my knowledge, uh, KF AD masks are more specifically designed that it'll fit very tightly on your face. As opposed to dental masks, as we have experienced before, Mm -hmm. it's very light, it's very open. Mm -hmm. So that makes me worry a little bit bit more with the the, the dental masks. All right. And I assume that these all, again, follow those WHO guidelines that we talked about before. Um, Not necessarily. Not necessarily. uh, It's it's more of a a very... um, Right on the point, time period type of uh, material that they came up with. All right. Well, the good news is that um, here in Korea, we don't really need to make our own masks and we've got uh, plenty of masks. If not now, they will be soon available. Let's move on to alpacas Mm -hmm. and llamas. (laughs) Um, Very interesting topic. Yes. um, So I had actually not come across this, but it is an interesting. Apparently, animals in this camelid group, they produce a special class of antibodies called nanobodies. Right. And um, some scientists in Sweden, they are working with Tyson. And that's the name of a 12-year-old alpaca. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a similar experiment going on somewhere else. So exactly what do these nanobodies produced by alpacas and llamas, how can they help um, us develop a treatment for COVID-19? Okay, so if we go back to the... the nature of the, uh, our body fighting against the virus. Mm-hmm. We have to come up with some sort of antibodies. Right. Normally in humans, they make a, uh, I, I shouldn't say huge, but relatively bigger antibodies that attack these viruses in, at certain focal points. You mean in size-wise? In, in right. si- size-wise, uh-huh. yes. Bigger. Uh-huh. Yeah, bigger. Uh, but in camelids, mm-hmm. the animals of camelids, uh-huh. they make antibodies much smaller. Nano Nanobodies. Size. That's okay. why they are called nanobodies. What's good about these is that because they're much smaller in size, they can be much more easily manipulated for the people to come up with possible neutralizing nanobodies, mm-hmm. quoted unquote. Uh, it, it, uh, it's, uh, to, in, inside the labs and studies, it would be much easier for people to actually manipulate them. Mm-hmm. So they're studying very deeply into that. I just don't believe it can actually be applied to humans just yet. <laughs> so there's a, uh, well, I'm still waiting in mm-hmm. hopes, but uh, we'll see what happens with them. All right. Yeah. Speaking of sort of blood, um, there was this report about COVID-19 and blood type. It's actually not brand new because I had seen this report, I think maybe a month or two ago, saying that certain blood types may be more susceptible to become more sick and also getting infected. But now we're seeing reports from China, from Russia, and now from Europe as well saying the same thing. If you're blood type A, you may be more susceptible. And if you're blood type O, much less susceptible. So mm-hmm. tell us about that, the science behind this. So I feel much safer now that I'm blood type O. You are? But, oh, but, look at you. <laughs> I was just joking. <laughs> okay, so blood types are one of the easiest um, criteria that we could look into in, in the realm of clinical studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, 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 like being ethnicities. Okay. You know how uh, some of the studies compare different ethnicities yes. for their vulnerability mm-hmm. to the infection? Right. It's just like that. Uh, well, it's just numbers. Mm. It doesn't necessarily mean that blood type O's can just go out and take daily lives just freely. But there were significant differences. 35% less chance for you and 45% increased chance for blood type A's and there are a lot more blood type A's here in Korea. But we always have to consider 
the uh, the method of sampling okay. is very limited to mm-hmm. a certain only a certain number of people. It might be due to the geographical area, or it might be due to any many 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 different uh, confounding factors. Okay. So for the time being, let's just have that as an information that we know. Uh-huh. But we all all of us we really need to be careful in in regards to the infection. We're almost out of time. So very quickly, how worried should we be about mosquitoes and maybe playing in the water in pool and beaches? It's getting hot. People are doing that. Don't go to any public places that have too many people. I wouldn't worry too much about mosquitoes yet. That is good to hear because we hear that the mosquitoes are going to be hungrier than usual this year. Right. We just don't have any scientific proof that mosquitoes transfer these. But just be careful not to get a mosquito bite. So, of course, True. they True. are very uncomfortable. Thank True. you so much once again, Dr. Kwok. Thank you. Thank you.